Welcome everybody to our vision panel, our second one of the day. Hopefully you've all had a chance to have a little bit of coffee or tea. This is our, this is our last session, right? Our last session? Okay, great. I'm very honored to be here. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am Rebecca Hall. I'm on, very honored to be on the Executive Advisory Board for the Center for Health and Nature, and so I've seen it grow over the last four years. And I'm also very honored here to chair our, our session with our um, distinguished speakers for today. I heard that earlier today, you had some very creative and challenging questions in the first vision panel. Is that true? Yeah, very. <laughs> well, I'm going to lobby some softball questions, so don't worry about it. Um, unless, of course, you would like to answer all of your questions from the perspective as if you had access to on-demand, unlimited resources and astral projection and artificial <laughs> intelligence or, or something along those lines. Feel free to, to jazz it up a little bit. Okay, so we'll start today with um, one question across the board. Um, what research data could help each of you achieve the missions of your institution? Anyone like to take that? Sure. Um, the, you know, the first question of every panel is always like, not me, not me, not me. Um, I mean, I, I think we were just talking about this. I think our park is so new. Uh, we're just looking to even figure out what questions we want to ask, right? So obviously we want to figure out who's in our park, how they're using the park, uh, but also think about what are we doing to the water quality? What are we doing with the temperature along the creek? All, all sorts of questions that we're just still trying to figure out what questions we want to ask. Um, from my perspective, we are able to collect location intelligence around where individuals are. The hard part is geotagged health outcomes. So working with like a major healthcare system that has a massive database of, of what health outcomes are happening among that population, and then we can pair that with what we know about where they live and where they're going on a daily basis would really move the needle for us. And so in other countries where there's single payer healthcare systems and those massive data sets exist, we're gonna go after that. We haven't mapped the rest of the world yet, but having that in the US, at least a single large data set of health outcomes that we can pair to our location and behavioral intelligence would be ideal. Have you had a chance to work with any hospital systems on that type of project before? Uh, no, not yet. We've worked with other universities and other kind of longitudinal studies like the nurses health study or the twin study and CDC data and various other smaller data sets. But obviously, again, the more data we can hoover in, the better our models will become. So one of the things we're looking at, we did the, with the Center for Health and Nature, we did the study to look at the um, health benefits and reduced hospitalizations, but we really want to understand the use of the by greenways, and so NatureQuant could help out. So we're also working with Center for Health and Nature on that as well, and looking at um, kind of six different points in different types of neighborhoods, uh, low income, medium income, high income, understanding uh, who's using it, and then trying to figure out from there why or why not, and then you know, uh, information to to help uh, encourage everyone higher use on all of our bikes. I love that question, Rebecca, because that was the question I tried to tackle at lunchtime. But let me answer slightly differently than I did earlier. I'm going to put on my Trust for Public Land hat. That's the organization I work for. We create parks and trails and green schoolyards. And for 50 years, what we've done is measure our accomplishments based on acres and dollars and numbers of ribbons cut. But we have a strategic plan which says that our top priorities are health, equity, climate action, and strong communities. So increasingly, what we're doing is moving toward evaluating the impact of our projects to the extent to which they deliver health, equity, climate action, and community. So the research question is, if you do a park or you do a green schoolyard, how do you measure the health impact? If you do a trail through a community, do you strengthen the community and how do you measure and document that? So it, it's uh, operational ways of measuring and documenting the impact of what we do and then learning from that so that if we didn't do it just right, we adjust what we do next time to get a better result. Great. Um, thank you for, for that. Is there, I would like to encourage anybody that's in the audience to go ahead and put your hand up, or if you have a question that you'd like to write down and send up to the front, I think there's some cards around that you could pass um, to the front. 
um, so we can keep the conversation going. There are a few questions from our audience that they've passed forward already. If you're ready for your next challenge, ready for it. All right, all right, we got it. We got a gigum and a thumbs up all at the same time. Okay, so the first one I believe is for you, Jesus, um, from Juliet Reyes. Will these projects help or be affected by the reoccurring blue algae bloom in the Austin waters? And are there efforts to use native vegetation that supports our local fauna? Yes, so the, the, the intent is to use native, native vegetation all around. Um, you know, we work, we're working closely with one of the partnering organizations is the Watershed Protection Department, and they're charged with overall water quality. So they're the ones that are going to be monitoring the water and making sure that we're, we're um, preserving the quality of the water. One of the interesting things about the way that it's designed with the storm control tunnel, we're actually coming back to artificially um, uh, operate the creek. So all the stormwater is being collected on the northern end and shipped under the tunnel and then back out. Uh, during some rain events, some will go in there. But so there's also opportunities to, to pump the water back up so we can try to try to mimic some of the natural flow of the creek as well to try to sort of train the creek to be more. <clears throat> That's great. We have a couple more here. Um... I'm not sure if you would like to answer, if you'd like to ask these yourself, Perry, or if you'd like me to do them on your behalf. Yeah, okay, all right, I'll start. Um, so the first one is um, a little broader. So uh, this is for Lisa. Uh, what has been, what are your thoughts on connecting the Shepherd Drive area of Houston to Memorial Park through the BioGreenway uh, project? Yes, yeah, so that's a connection that a lot of people want to make. We've got uh, Buffalo Bayou Park that kind of ends at Shepherd Drive and then Memorial Park that's not too far away. And in between there, there's really not a great way to uh, hike or bike. And if we could make that connection, it would be amazing for uh, everybody. The Memorial Park is a very well used park in Houston. Um, so we're looking at a quite a few different ways of potentially connecting, but we haven't landed on anything right now. And whatever we do is we, I talked about uh, looking at projects and looking at buildability and some like land acquisition and other kind of uh, challenges that you might have to actually get trails and, and uh, uh, hike and bike connectivity to happen. And that's kind of what we have to deal with in that area. So I can't uh, give you a specific answer, but we in the city are all working on that and trying to figure out the best way that we can do that uh, economically and uh, safely. Um, and uh, kind of a follow-up to that, uh, are you familiar with Mary Tally, which is a landscaping yes, service? I am. Yes, and uh, apparently they work on making detention ponds into parks. Yes, they have some amazing detention ponds that um, Mary Tally's worked on a whole neighborhood. Uh, she started working, changing a dry detention pond into a wet detention pond with um, trails around it. And then they're uh, growing from there. And there's some other dry detention ponds that are turning into prairie and forest and connecting that all up in a neighborhood in Northwest Houston. And so that that's uh, similar to what we're trying to do other detention ponds around uh, Harris County. Yeah. That, that learning from Mary on the things that she's already done and implementing those across the, the county. Any questions from the from the audience? Oh, we have another one. Another one coming up. Oh, okay. <laughs> you ready to be honest? Okay. Is anyone doing a good job? on those impact evaluations? <laughs> um, boy, I don't think anybody has it nailed down. Um, I know in, in the land trust sector, which is part of the larger ecosystem of people who do projects, there are 1,500 or 2,000 land trusts in the country, and they all pretty much measure uh, what they do based on acres and dollars and ribbons cut. Um, I don't think anybody has, as a matter of standard practice, looking at the social and environmental outcomes of park projects. So I think our whole sector needs to move ahead in that direction. Not to say there haven't been good individual efforts, but it isn't standard practice anywhere, as far as I know. Yeah, would you agree, Lisa? Uh, yes, I would agree. And uh, we are looking at things like trying to do a park equity study around Harris County. 
the park system is equitable. And part of the uh, challenge we have is we don't have enough data about the parks themselves, about the quality of the parks, about what's in the park, about the money that was spent on the parks, uh, and you know, over time for either for maintenance or putting them in and then re renovating them. And so just that gathering of all that data to be able to then understand, I mean, we know where the parks are located, that's, you know, that's kind of uh, where we are. So there's a lot more data and information needed so we can really dig in and look at what, uh, you know, where parks are, are they serving people and what are the quality of those parks that people, do people feel comfortable there, um, all of that. Mm -hmm. Just wanna, um, if I could take that question, modify it a little bit and direct it to Jesus. And, and here's why. Jesus is bilingual. He, he speaks both park and rec and education, having a background in education. In the education world, we monitor outcomes all the time. Schools do testing, they evaluate how they're doing. Could you compare and contrast the education sector with the park sector? How would schools work if they evaluated outcomes the way we do in parks? I mean, that's a great question. I, I don't, I don't think that in the parks and recreation field, we yet know how to evaluate uh, impact. So, you know, practitioners know and listen and say, well, here's what we do. We provide opportunities for people to, to move around, to be healthy. We provide, you know, high quality, welcoming, inclusive, safe spaces. You know, we provide uh, opportunities for communities to come together, all of these things, but we don't know there's a big gap between what we do and sort of the outcomes that we're expecting, whether it's health, public safety, education, you name it. I think, I think that's, so I would then, you know, your answer to the first question is like, I'm much more um, sort of, I guess, negative about the fact that we just have not figured out how to do that, how to measure it. I mean, I think now part of the reason these things are so exciting is because we're starting to have that, those discussions. The other, the other gap I think is practice, practitioners aren't used to looking at the data and reading the reports and looking at the graphs. So there's more and more and more data that's out there and the research you all are doing. We just haven't gotten it, gotten into the hands of the parks and park professionals. So I think that's another, another thing. I, I would throw out there, there is a tool called iTree, which doesn't look at parks. It looks at basically urban canopy and all the ecosystem benefits that come from each tree. And it's, you know, it's been built and modified for decades now. I think there's an opportunity to build a similar software platform for parks where they kind of, we build a community around what do we want to track? How do we scale it? And it just becomes a common language that we can all use through a software platform that's, that's scalable and easy for everybody to kind of rally around. So that's yeah. me with my software hat on <laughs> looking at parks because it's been, iTree has been very successful. So they, it always makes me wonder, and sometimes looking at the data that you presented today, a lot of it is correlative. Right. Do you sometimes when you're presenting this correlation of impact that's going to save $30 million over the next five years, do you get pushback sometimes? Really want to demonstrate the ROI of a project you might want to invest in? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, there are associations that we find, right? We are not yet claiming we're causing anything, but we have enough data and enough evidence that you know these correlations are about. And it's the best, in my opinion, one of the best tools we have to predict what's going to happen after we change something in our environment. So, I mean, there's pushback because there's a lot of opinions, which is healthy, but uh, I wouldn't say anyone's accused of it. Anyone else? <laughs> Jared's lucky. No pushback. <laughs> well, there, you know, there's, um, there are different approaches to large groups of data. And, and Jared, you said earlier during your talk that you don't come into this uh, with testable hypotheses. You come into it with large pools of data and then you yes. look around for things that are interesting. The, the challenge with doing that is that if there are confounders lurking in the data, and there always are, yeah. and you haven't systematically collected data in ways that allow you to control those confounders, then you may be stuck with confounding that, that's really hard to overcome. Right. So I, I think you know, that there's huge potential, I agree, in, in big data analytics using AI and other algorithms. And there's also a huge uh, threat because without the analytical epidemiologic approach that's sort of normal in that field, mm -hmm. you can make big mistakes. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I look at our data as kind of the canary in the coal mine, right? We find an alarm or something that's really associated 
And it doesn't tell us what's happening, but it, it gives us a, a point to focus. And then you go back in and you really parse apart that one element and you try and find those factors. So I, we're not the end. We are, I think, a, a, a beginning of how we can pull all this like very complicated web of data together to find things to focus on. Yeah. So that, that gets to a, a little bit of the next question, which is what policy approaches do you think would best advance health through nature? I'm going to talk about one of my favorites. We all have lots of answers to that, I know, but I want to talk about housing policy. I think that any of us who cares about nature, contact, and health has to care about housing. And I think that because in every jurisdiction in the country, there's a housing shortage. A population has been growing much faster than our housing stock as a nation. And that means that if there's a desirable house, let's say near a park, then the real estate values of that house are rising fast. And multiply that nationally, and you've got a situation where young people just starting out in life can't afford to buy a house anymore, where we have a shameful number of homeless people in, in the country. But at the same time, we need to build a lot more housing. We need to protect green space access for everybody, which means there is a sort of an urban planning architecture set of challenges about designing a combination of housing and green space. So those of us who care about green space need to be waving the green space flag, but we also need to make common purpose with those who care about uh, affordable housing for everybody so that everybody has a good place to live with access to a green space. I think the two goals collide much more than they should so that if we married them together and strove to reach both together, we would do a lot better. That's very interesting. So um, Lisa and Hayes. For some of the projects that you've done in Austin and Houston, do you see those kind of long-term effects and people moving, right? It's the changes. Suddenly the, you know, the cost of living close to these beautiful parks that you're building keeps going up and then you have people moving out, right? Um, how do you how do you address that or do you address it? I think it does happen. I don't think so. Bayou Greenways, we kind of built them everywhere. And so it's not like there's this one amazing and everybody wants to be there. We're kind of doing a distributive model so that you know people aren't trying to go back and forth, but we do work on a lot of park projects where um, if there's a big upgrade in the park, uh, it's a lot of times that happens at the same time where the community is changing anyway. Um, so, but I don't know that there's a good answer or how you can. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't, I don't know the answer. So, so back to my work in municipal parks and recreation, you know, I just want to pick up on something Howie said. We used to get into these, these arguments all the time with the public housing folks about, you know, communities would, would, would say we want housing and, and others would say we want parks. And instead of us saying, well, we need both, we were sort of, we were kind of put up against each other. So I think, you know, the idea of a policy framework that ensures that, that green space is just as important as housing and you do it together. I think that's, that's a, I think part of the challenge on, in terms of this whole displacement piece is, is it, it's hard. Like in Austin, I mentioned earlier, all of the people who used to be there are gone now. Now the people that are coming back where the housing is going up, it's really high cost housing. So the policy uh, uh, issues that need to be resolved is when you bring that housing back, making sure that every developer, everybody has some sort of affordable housing component. I mentioned one of the properties that we're going to build when the police department headquarters moves is going to be multi-use. So the idea is to also have housing there. We want that housing to be to be some of that to be um, affordable housing to make sure that we can provide that opportunity. But it's it's a challenge. Um, yeah. uh, wisdom is a challenge. Sorry. <laughs> Question. Um, go
I can just speak to the Bayou Greenways and how the land ownership for that is through mainly through Harris County Flood Control District and it's mainly because of all of our flooding problems and so they uh, have easements or own land along most of the major bayous in Houston right now and so they have allowed the city to build trails on the land that they own and so that's how we're able to work with it. Um, in, some, in some cases, they don't own the land underneath the easement that they have. And so then we have to go back and buy little parcels of land from, you know, a, a person thinks their uh, lot stops at their back fence, but it actually goes to the middle of the bayou. So then we have to go and tell them there, you know, you actually own that land and we want to buy this from you and build a trail on there and, and those kind of things. So it uh, ends up being an expensive proposition, but it's, you know, something that we uh, knew needed to happen and so has been integrated into the process. Uh, so I don't know how that would work in other cities, what the ownership models are for like rivers and yeah. waterways, but. Yeah. I, I thought you were going to go in a different direction with the question because I think about ownership in, in several ways. So one, the technical aspect, the legal aspect is uh, Waterloo Greenway is owned by the city. So the Parks and Recreation Department, it's public property. It's stewarded on behalf of the residents by the Parks and Recreation Department. But it's interesting because one of the challenges we have uh, in our work is this narrative that this is a private uh, park that we're building. Uh, we're bringing in you know, more than $100 million of philanthropic money into it for capital in addition to five or $6 million a year of operating dollars. So, so there's a sense of ownership with all of those stakeholders as well. So one of the things that we have to do, and, and, and I'm not up here saying it's easy, but is to be unapologetic, excuse me, unapologetic about who this park serves. Like it can't just be my board members. It can't just be the people who have do donated. It can't just be the people who come to concerts. It has to be for everyone. And so you know, the question about the data, one of the things that we're really trying really hard to understand is again, back to the very basic, who's using our park and where do they live? And so starting to understand, like right now we're, we, you know, we've had visitation from every single zip code in Austin, Texas, which is, which is important given where we are. But now we want to focus on specific zip codes to understand what's keeping them from feeling like this is their park. And so that goes back to how do we expand the ownership to the folks that are currently. I just want to build on that if I could and, and play with the concept of ownership a little bit. I want to tell a story about a project that Trust for Public Land did in Wenatchee, Washington, which is a small city, uh, half white, half Latino. The park on the Latino side of town was a very poor quality. So people from TPL got involved, got to know members of the community, spent literally a couple of years in meetings in people's kitchens and in churches building trust. Out of that came a community group called Parque Padrinos that was able to raise money and renovate the park. But at the same time, it formed a very strong social fabric in the community, uh, such that when along came the COVID pandemic, and the Latino community was under vaccinated, whom did the health department ask for help in getting vaccinations out there but Parque Padrinos? Not only that, the votership in that community tripled over the course of the next few years. And believe me, those people feel that they own the park. It's not a matter of having a deed, but it's a matter of having ownership and voice and having been part of the design and now part of the oversight. So that's a small town, but the exact same process is playing out at the 11th Street Bridge Project in Washington, D.C., where this is a project in Anacostia, or on the Anacostia River, that is now four, five, six years in, and they haven't turned one shovel full of dirt yet because they're doing community-based work, uh, small business incubation, job creation, job training. When that park finally gets built, you know who's going to own it? It's going to be the people in the community. So I think Deep community engagement and community oversight of the park moving out of the construction phase and into the operating phase may be the key to community ownership, which is a good thing. Really interesting conversation and, and uh, touched a little bit on barriers to access right? parks. And in a way, if we're successful in having these prescriptions for people and time in nature in order to impact their health, your parks and recreation department in a way becomes a healthcare delivery system. Then you have to worry about access, possibly even reimbursement 
right, through your insurance companies, maybe for people making it to and from those green spaces. Have any of you started to work or even think about what it would be like to have health insurance companies on board? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of our North Star. We would love to see concept of nature dose be an integral part of like the healthcare system. And at least here, that means the insurance company is going to pay for it or sponsor it or support it or promote it. So that is one of our end goals. Um, that or like the CDC, right? But public health broadly. So two quick comments. One is that the, the power of the kind of evidence that we heard presented this morning is the first step in getting to that place. Because what we need to do is port the findings from the green, the green space world over to the healthcare world and say, this is actually an effective and safe health intervention. This is the real thing. Um, so evidence generation is really important. Um, I want to shift from insurance companies over to hospital systems. That's an interesting opportunity. Hospitals have to make community investments. They do that based on the findings of community health needs assessments. Now, that's been a longstanding IRS requirement for hospitals, but it was reinforced by the terms of the Affordable Care Act. Many hospitals no longer have to spend as much money on uncompensated care because more people are insured. That means that hospitals have the opportunity to make investments in parks and green space in their communities as part of their community investments. I think we'll see more and more hospitals around the country doing that. I mean, we've had a, a few leaders are doing it already, but that's a great source. It's evidence-based as we now know, and it's legal and it's financially feasible. If I could, I, I think the one thing that we're struggling with being, um, I mean, we're, Kind of a pseudo for profit, non profit entity right now is it demonstrating that there's cost savings by getting people outside. So that's one of our goals is saying, look, if you use Nature Dose, you, you go, whatever your goal is, 120 minutes a week, you then cost less in terms of healthcare spending. So I think translating that ultimately into economic language will move that down the path further for insurance companies being motivated to save money simply by getting people outside. Fantastic. So Lisa, hey, Susie, you never knew you were going to be CEOs. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, I think we're about at the end of our time for our session. Thank you all very much for your insight and for sharing that with us today. Um, Jay, I hand it over to you. Thank you, everyone. I love that idea of using community health benefits from Methodist to uh, fund parks and green space, Rebecca. So we're going to put that on our list. Uh, wow, what an amazing day. I am, I am jazzed. I am just, uh, thrilled with all the speakers that we've heard and the conversations and the questions. And now it's time to turn it over to the closer. So I am delighted uh, to introduce Joni Carswell, who is the president and CEO of Texan by Nature, and Dr. Robert Jackson who is the Distinguished Chair of Performing Arts Medicine, Professor of Clinical Medicine uh, at Houston Methodist Hospital. I don't know if you guys should be worried that we're fighting over who's going first as we're walking up here, but. <laughs> uh, first, thank you. Uh, thank you to Dr. Jay Maddock and Texas A&M for hosting us here today. Thank you to Megan Talbert and Yan Yan Chen for all of the work that you put into the logistics and making today possible. Thank you to Texas A&M and to Houston Methodist Hospital for being amazing partners in this initiative. And of course, Don and Cynthia for the lovely um, evening we had last night and the continual just uplifting of the work that we do and, and forcing us to think bigger and broader and come together and collaborate. It's, it's very much appreciated. And we wouldn't be here today without each of the people that I mentioned. And of course, it goes without saying, thank you so much to the speakers who came and shared and participated in the panels. You've given us so much to think about as far as evidence that's already there, the way that evidence is being applied, and then all of the opportunities that we have in front of us from a research and an application standpoint, it's, it's inspiring and you're deeply appreciated for taking the time today to be here. So as I was thinking about 
coming today and listening and learning what the latest was, I, I, I thought back to how did this all start? And as many of you know, this started with a Health and Nature Symposium that was co-hosted by Texan by Nature and Houston Methodist Hospital back in 2016. We had Dr. Frumpkin there. We had many in this room who were in, in attendance that day. And everyone that was there, I actually wasn't there, but everything that I heard after that symposium was just how inspired everyone was by the mounting evidence of nature's positive benefit and on health. And so after that symposium, there was this vision that what if we brought everyone together um, to address the gaps in evidence that were up-leveled at that symposium? What if we brought together the, the gaps in prescription, the gaps in treatment, the gaps in access that the various speakers um, talked about that day and developed a center that would address those things? And that was the catalyst of launching the Center for Health and Nature in 2018. There was a vision of creating the evidence pursuing research that would build on the evidence that was already out there, translating that evidence to application and making it available, available to healthcare systems and to conservation organizations to make the case for the work that they wanted to do. So again, I wanna thank Dr. Jay Maddock and I wanna thank Dr. Bita Cash, I don't see Bita right now, but I wanna thank both of them for their leadership in pushing the center forward over the last five years. The progress that you guys have made in completing the research and publishing findings and partnering with community leaders to better understand access that that's evident of the folks who are on the stage today and hosting symposia like this one. They've been opportunities for us to learn the latest, to build on the latest and to build new partnerships. The development of the fellows program to connect experts across the United States to push this important work forward. I'm impressed by everything that, that y'all's leadership has resulted in and really excited about the future. So as we wrap up today, I was listening throughout for the, the nuggets that stuck out to me. And of course, I'm, I, I come from the, the perspective of the conservation organization, of the, of the group that's trying to push the care for and the access to nature forward. But there were a couple of things that stuck out. First, Aaron opening the day. Everyone should spend 20 minutes outside unless they're busy, and then you should spend an hour. Like, absolutely, right? Uh, you know, we're, we're preaching to the choir. We all agree with that. But through that lens, what are the things that we can make sure that everyone else sees that and believes that and, and, and wants to spend that hour outside? A couple of things that we learned that stuck out to me. 10 minutes outside, that 10 minute break made a difference. We can go back to all of our organizations and share that very easy thing to share and make a change today on how we're interacting with nature. Seven to eight minutes of nature sounds. We can use that with our families. We can use that again with our organizations. We can start to share that. Engaging the community and the school. I loved the use of the citizen scientists and really getting involved in Houston Parks Board and Waterloo Greenway both talked about that importance. Dr. Frumpkin talked about it, creating that social fabric, engaging that community so that you are creating advocates for the future. Environmental funding that's coming available for some of these health initiatives. We heard about SEPs and finding better health outcomes. So more and more as we are publishing this evidence, dollars are coming available to make a change in our communities. The fact that nature access and childhood has long-term on every aspect of our health. All of these things are learnings that we can start to apply today. And then we also heard nuggets from these experts on where we should go. We heard that all populations and partners need to be involved. Everyone needs to be represented and engaged. We need deeper collaboration. That was a unifying theme across almost every single presentation. We heard that we needed to tie ecosystem service values. That, that was very eye-opening. In my world, we talk about ecosystem service values every single day to, to talk about the conservation projects that we do. And there's a big gaping hole when it comes to human health that we can fill as we work together. So how do we create that change? We collaborate, 
We bring together the interdisciplinary partners. We do fe feasibility research. We focus on communication. We create advocates. And we shift the evidence. I really liked what Dr. Frumkin just said on this panel. We shift the evidence to the insurance providers and the hospital system. And that's a big gap. That's not what we've done so far. We let Lisa and Jesus become hospital directors, which is kind of <laughs> awesome, right? Uh, so, so we bring all of those together and we think in new ways to solve the issues in front of us. So, you know, my background is in strategy and in, in tech. And one thing that comes to mind is how much of our strategic terminology is actually borrowed from the industry. I don't know if you guys have ever thought about it, but when we talk about our biggest opportunities, we say it's a blue sky opportunity. We equate it to the vast expanse of sky. When we talk about the work we do, we talk about ripple effects. We compare it to a small pebble in a body of water, the effect that we can have. When we talk about our top performers, we call them stars. So every step in how we do business and how we're creating strategy, we're equating it back to the awe the magnitude of nature. Nature inspires us, it nurtures us. And it's my hope today that we'll take what we've learned, what these experts have highlighted as the opportunities in front of us, and we'll look at them as blue sky opportunities moving forward, new ways that we can work together. We'll think about and measure and articulate and communicate the ripple effects that this work has. And we will enable the stars of all of our organizations to take part in this work. We'll, we'll value it as most important and create the time for them to provide the evidence, to shift the evidence to where it needs to go so we can create incredible change as we move forward. We have a big opportunity. Again, I wanna thank you guys for being here and taking part in the partnerships that I know will come from today. So I encourage you, get each other's cards, make sure you're thinking about who you need on your team as you're leading, leaving here today, because this is an inflection point for us and we're very excited. So thank you very much and welcome to Dr. Jackson. That's a hard act to follow. I knew I should have gone first. <clears throat> You know, she is so well-spoken and she's such a great leader. And I wanna just reflect on the past and then briefly talk about the present and the future. We would not be here if it wasn't for Texan by Nature and First Lady Laura Bush in collaboration with Cynthia Pickett-Stevenson, Mark Boom and the Methodist Conference. They had an outstanding uh, uh, symposium in 2016. And then Cynthia and I and Tita Buford got together at her uh, compound in Anahuac, and we said, how can we take this to the next level? That was 2017. And then 2018, the Center for Health and Nature was formed. So we have dilithium crystals in our spaceship, and we are going places. But we would not have really had our, our start if it hadn't been for Texan by Nature and First Lady Laura Bush. So she's not here, but let's give her a hand anyway. So uh, what should the Center for Health and Nature be? Well, I think we've, we've really uh, uh, elaborated on it, this, uh, this meeting. We're, we're the center and there's nothing like it in the United States. And I asked Howie, is there anything like it in the world? And he came up with maybe a few. And then he said, no, there is nothing like the Center for Health and Nature in the entire world, possibly in the universe. We are, we're the center for uh, health and nature for research, education, but really our marching orders should be policy. And with the research that's being done, we're gonna have nothing but success. And uh, in closing, I'm gonna take orders from uh, President Roosevelt, uh, who uh, was a great speaker. And uh, he advised uh, folks who, we're giving speeches to be sincere, be brief, and be seated. Thank you very much.
we're done. Thank you everyone for attending today. We really appreciate you being here. We loved everyone involved. If you were not on our mailing list, if you got this through somebody else, uh, please find either Megan or Yan Yan, uh, let us know. And um, we're delighted to talk to anybody that wants to get involved more in health and nature. We are I have a student campus nature RX group that's going on here. For if you are a student, we'd love to get you involved in that. If you're a practitioner, we'd love to talk to you about park prescriptions. If you're a landowner, we'd love to connect you there. And a researcher, we would definitely love to partner. So please be in touch and we will see you at our next symposium. Thank you.